From advertising to software as a service to data. Across all of our programs and clients, we've seen a 55 to 65 percent open rate. Getting brands authentically integrated into content performs better than TV advertising. Typical lifespan of an article is about 24 to 36 hours. If we're reaching out to the right person with the right message and a clear call to action, then it's just a matter of timing. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast, and I hear everything production. In this podcast, you'll hear the stories of world-class marketers that use technology to drive business results and achieve career success. We'll unearth the real-world experiences of some of the brightest minds in the marketing and technology space so you can learn the tools, tips, and tricks they've learned along the way. Now here's the host of the MarTech Podcast, Benjamin Shapiro. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast. I'm your host, Benjamin Shapiro, and today we're going to discuss strategies for improving your margins. Joining us is Mike Bernard, who is the CMO of Vendavo, which offers software solutions that blend AI with data science and human expertise to help their enterprise clients find the right price at the right time for the right customer. Yesterday, Mike and I talked about the starting point for improving your margins, and today we're going to continue our conversation talking about whether your product is priced correctly or not. All right, here's the second part of my conversation with Mike Bernard, the CMO of Vendavo. Mike, welcome back to the MarTech Podcast. Great to be here, Ben. Excited to have you back on the show. Look, we talked yesterday about getting more juice out of the orange, about improving your profitability understanding your margins, having your finger on the pulse of your business, and then making some decisions on how fast you want to grow as opposed to how much you want your business to make, what the profitability should be. And fundamentally in there, there is a cost management portion, but I want to focus on the other side of the coin. How do you figure out what you should be selling your product for? I run a podcast production business outside of being the host of the MarTech podcast called I Hear Everything, and we produce podcasts for other brands. And there's a million people that produce podcasts for other brands, and I never know how to figure out whether we should be selling at a premium, should we be a higher volume, lower price point. Help me figure out how do brands look at their pricing and understanding where they should be in the marketplace. I'm guessing everyone should just come to you, and then that would just solve the problem, right? It would just be solved for them. They would just hire you. And that wraps up this episode of the MarTech. Oh, sorry. No, you had more to say. Go on. I thought it was a great idea. I figured we were done. So I think it does depend a little bit on the type of industry you're in. For example, let's go with the high end. Let's say you've got a a product that you manufacture or that you produce, or even you have some sort of uh, service that you produce that's considered like a premium or a luxury brand. Look at Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, what they've been able to do with their high fashion stuff, right? So because things are deemed a high value or there's a status symbol associated with them, they have a lot of ability to price at a high level and keep that price the way it is and make a ton of margin off of their stuff. You know, if you have a Birkin bag, I have no idea how much they cost to manufacture, but I can tell you that they don't cost that much. Tens of thousands of dollars. You believe that? <laughs> I, I had to Google that yeah. while we were talking about it for another episode. Yeah, they're like ASP at $13,000. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's a handbag. But people are willing to pay for that because there's a scarcity object that goes along with that. It's also deemed as a status symbol, luxury stuff. On the other end of the market, you've got things that are highly commoditized. So gasoline, milk. Podcast producers. Podcast producers. Other things that you would have in your house that you know you need, but you couldn't tell a brand. Like, let's say you want to install a new light fixture in your house. You're like, I need some wire for that. Do you care who makes the wire? Probably not. You probably couldn't even mention a brand of a wire manufacturer. So highly commoditized. So then in that case, you have to figure out what are your raw materials that go into that? What are other market conditions that are going to fluctuate? So in a lot of those situations, you've got highly volatile pricing when it comes to your raw materials. So oil, for example, up and down every day. Hopefully it doesn't go up too much. Actually bad if it goes down a lot too. Highly volatile, right? So you need to be able to monitor that really, really well. And then you've got everything in the middle. And that's where it gets really tricky. And so that's where it's a combination of your market research. That includes your customer's willingness to pay, perceived value of the end product or service that you're offering. It would be your ability to do marketing, subject we all love, right? So can you create demand out there by creating a category that people think, I need to get involved with this kind of stuff. 
So it has to do with a lot of research and then it becomes trial and error. And you may have to throw some stuff out there and go, ooh, I really lost my shirt on that. Or it's like, ooh, I'm priced so high, no one wants to buy this. And you'll learn very quickly by doing that research and then doing your best guess and then doing some trial and error out in the market to see where your pricing really is gonna land. That's gonna be that sweet spot of I'm making good money and I'm also able to grow the business as well. I try not to make these podcasts too much about my products and services, but I'm going to be a little selfish here. The reason is I don't want to talk about other people's pricing and some of the challenges that we've had. But I do think that a case study is a good way to think about this type of problem where how I describe pricing of podcasts, the industry looks at it on a per episode basis where you can self-produce a podcast and it's going to cost you $1,000 to $2,000 a month and you are going to put in mostly your own labor, which people don't calculate, and have middling to no results most of the time if people are self-producing their podcasts. Then you can have a producer where somebody's going to come in and create the podcast and publish it for you. And some producers will publish your content and promote it. And some people will create social video. There's all sorts of different services that go into it, but generally $750 to $1,500 per episode. And then there is the highly produced non-interview style of podcast, which you can add an order of magnitude onto the interview style podcast. So instead of $750 an episode, there's $7,500 up to $15,000. I hear everything. The production company that I run, we are great at taking interviews, long format content and breaking it into shorter format content. So we're sitting down for an hour and we're going to record two podcast episodes. If I were charging a company to do this, I would charge between $600 to $1,200 per episode, lower than the industry average on a per episode basis. But we ask our clients to do more episodes because we can consolidate the amount of time it takes to produce content. Two hours a week, you can produce five episodes. Now you've got a daily show in only two hours and it's $600 an episode. So for us, that makes it $3,000 a week, $12,000 a month, where other brands are saying, well, we're $1,500 an episode and you're gonna do four. So they charge $6,000 for four episodes and we charge $6,000 for 20. Most of the time, what ends up happening is they're doing two episodes a week. They're saying $3,000 a month and we're saying six. So instead of 20 episodes, it's two. Obviously, it's not an apples to apples comparison, but I still don't know if our pricing is part of the problem in our go to market. Is it the absolute cost people are looking at that's the problem? Is it the unit cost that people don't understand? Is it the services? So by all means, I don't mean to make this into a free consulting call. This is a case study. For brands like mine who are like, our pricing is different, our modeling is different, our product is different than everybody else. How do you get data on whether your pricing is a fit or not? First, I would add, as a guy who has P&L authority and has budget authority for a marketing team, and we look at our expenses all the time, I would say maybe what you need to consider is that you're in a space where there's not a general consensus of how much stuff should cost. A marketer doesn't know that it should cost $600 per episode on average because of what you just described, right? You can go and flip on a record button on your iPhone and record a podcast for free. It might be crappy, but it's free. And then you've got all the way over to, you know, the American public media spending a ton of money and they have a whole thing. So when you're in a situation where the market doesn't understand the value of what you produce, that makes it really tricky to, one, find data. And there are organizations out there that probably have data, whether it's Nielsen or something like that, that's starting to look at other mediums outside of traditional broadcast. But I would say you've got a little bit of a educate the market situation going on where you need to demonstrate that what you do and the price that you offer it for is actually a better deal. And here's the reasons why. You're going to get better production. You're going to get more episodes. We actually have a distribution network that's going to put it out there, not just dropping it on your own website. So you're going to get more visibility into it. And then be able to back that up with either probably both customer stories and data then that says, when you come with us on average, folks get X times more visibility, interaction, engagement, all that kind of stuff. And then with that, then here's some people who have benefited from working with us. They tell their story. It's really great. They love it. Uh, fantastic. 
And then what are the additional things that you can add value to? So in your case, it might be like, we're going to help drive traffic to your website. So there's an SEO value that goes with that because you're tapped into our network as well. You're going to be able to reuse the content in different areas. So it's not just podcast. All the different things that you're going to get value out of this is not just the podcast, right? It's going to be the graphics. It's going to be the 20-second audio clip that is the teaser for the longer one. It is the breaking up into three-minute chunks that you can put sound bites behind. You know, whatever are those additional things are. Yeah, content proliferation. Exactly. So I think for you and your specific use case there, the market just doesn't know what they should be paying. And it's tricky because there's so many factors out there that influence or don't influence that knowledge or the lack of knowledge. So like, like I said, it's free to record something on my notes function on my iPhone. Well, okay, that's not the same thing as a Netflix series starring Ryan Reynolds. Right? Both are different things. And so what are you looking for? There's a difference between the godfather and shooting an iPhone video. <laughs> exactly. So I think you can try to find data out there. It probably exists. You may have to pay for it because I'm not aware of any free government areas that would have that kind of data. Other industries, there would be free places you could find stuff that are a little bit more established. Like if you're a traditional manufacturer, you can find government data out there. You can also go to different data aggregators, analysts, that kind of thing to get the data and pay a fee to get it. But in your case, we got to educate the market a bit. And that just takes time, unfortunately, and takes a little bit of effort. So when you're in, let's say, a market that has a little bit more saturation, a little bit for more familiar with what pricing models should be like, let's take Tesla as an example. Right, Tesla was the first major commercial electric car. Lots of people were familiar with what cars should cost, but it was a different flavor, a different underlying technology, and had a different cost structure to operate. All right, so a sedan costs thirty to sixty thousand dollars for a mid-market sedan, and sixty to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars for a luxury sedan. And Tesla has a, I don't know, somewhere in between mid-market to luxury sedan, so sixty thousand dollars, but it's electric. It's different. You don't have to pay for gas. You have to pay for electricity, but you can't get electricity everywhere. How do you figure out how to price a new model if you were Tesla in the early days? What data points would you be looking at to figure out what your pricing should be? Yeah, so what Elon did with Tesla is actually, you know, a stroke of genius in that he combined scarcity mentality with the perception of a luxury brand with the kind of cachet of, I want to be the cool tech guy. That's kind of what he combined in the beginning, because when he first rolled out Tesla, you couldn't get them. You had to pay a bunch of money to get on a waiting list. And then once you actually got the thing, it was expensive. I mean, they were not Model 3, $30,000 vehicles when they first came out. Yeah, like $80,000 cars. Yeah, they were very expensive 10 years ago. So you have this situation where it's like, oh, I'm a cool tech person. I'm hip. I'm trendy. Also, love saving the environment. That's cool. I'm willing to fork out money to pay for the status symbol that is a car. Now, you could get a Chevy or a Toyota, but that's not cool. So you go for the Tesla because it says something about who you are or you want it to reflect who you are. So what Elon did with Tesla is marketing 101, right? Like how do you create demand or how do you spin a category into being able to charge a premium for what is essentially a vehicle to move you from point A to point B? It's no different than a Chevy or a Ford or a Toyota or a Volkswagen, right? But he was able to kind of create this air of this thing's really cool. And if you buy this, people will think you're cool, but people also think you're a good citizen of the earth because you're not creating fossil fuel pollution kind of stuff. So from that particular use case, what Elon Musk was able to do is not so much do a bunch of research to go, how much should I charge for this thing? He was able to go the Apple route, which is to say, I'm going to build a community of raving fans who like are diehard, sold on this perception of who they are, who they want to be. And then I'll get those folks to be my evangelists out there in the world. You don't see ads on TV for Tesla, right? You just know the name because it's got this movement behind it. Now, some of that luster might be wearing off with some of his recent escapades and also the Model 3 and all those things haven't had significant changes in their design. And so then all of a sudden you see others popping up like Rivian and others that are now kind of the cool tech car out there. So Tesla is going to have to pivot. And with that, back to our discussion from yesterday about margins, right? You've seen the margins of Tesla 
shrink from what used to be more like a tech company margin, shrinking down to what is more a traditional auto manufacturer like a General Motors or a Ford. So as a result, the stock price has been kind of not at the levels it's been. They've got to either figure out how do I increase my production to a Toyota level so that I can get the economies of scale in the production so that I can drive the price to manufacture them down so I can maintain my margins? Or do I release the next cool thing that all of a sudden people are like, oh my gosh, Tesla, I gotta get that. You could argue it's the Cybertruck. I would say those are super ugly. Those things are so ugly. I'm sorry, you're right. Whatever, but you know, they're different. I'll give you that, they're different. They don't look like a standard pickup truck. So Tesla's gonna try to figure out how do I get that cool factor back so I can drive those Apple level margins or maybe it's and, I don't know, crank that production up so that I'm producing cars at a level of a General Motors so that I can get the cost to produce that thing down lower and maintain my margins in there. And that's the dilemma that Tesla's in right now. I'll give you my one minute shtick on Tesla. I don't think Tesla is a car company. I think Tesla's an electric energy company. I think that the cars are the first example of their products and they sell a bunch of them, but cars are... Not commodities, but uh, most people have a car and the chances of you buying a luxury car is smaller and smaller. So I think that Tesla is going for lower margin, high volume, and they've seen that by lowering their prices as there's been more competition. But I think where Tesla is making traction is not just figuring out how to optimize their price on their cars. They're not making more margin. I think what they're doing is expanding horizontally. They are selling the cars. Then they're selling the home battery. Then they're going to sell you the solar panels on your house. Then they're building the charging network. So when you buy your Toyota electric Prius, you're going to be using a Tesla charging station. And that's why I think that I am bullish on them having a network effect, even if the shine is, for lack of a better term, off of the Apple with them being this luxury car. That's my take on Tesla. I totally agree with you. And I think, you know, if they can manage to perfect a solid state battery to combine with what you just said, then all of a sudden they own the infrastructure and love them or hate them. The Koch brothers have made a fortune off of owning the infrastructure in the oil and gas industry. Tesla can do the same thing for the electric vehicle, electric conductivity industry. And I think you're right. There's a lot more money to be made there than in just cars. I'm glad we agree there. So let's go back to pricing for a second, then I'll let you go. For everybody sitting at home saying, all right, I'm like Ben, I think my pricing's pretty good, but I'm not sure. What's the real way that you can quickly sanity check if your pricing is right? Can you get somebody to pay for it? I mean, you said real quick, right? If you can get someone to pay for it, then you're probably not too far off. And that wraps up this episode of the MarTech Podcast. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Mike Bernard, CMO of Vendavo. If you'd like to get in touch with Mike, you could find a link to his LinkedIn profile in our show notes, or you could visit his company's website, which is vendavo.com, V-E-N-D-A-V-O.com. Just one more link in our show notes I'd like to tell you about. If you didn't have a chance to take notes while you were listening to this podcast, head over to martechpod.com, where we have summaries of all of our episodes and contact information for our guests. You can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter, and you can even apply to be our next guest speaker on the MarTech Podcast. Of course, you can always reach out on social media. Our handle is MartechPod on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, or you can contact me directly. My handle on LinkedIn is Ben J. Shap, B-E-N-J-S-H-A-P. And if you haven't subscribed yet and you want a daily stream of marketing and technology knowledge in your podcast feed, we're going to publish an episode every day this year. So hit the subscribe button in your podcast app, and we'll be back in your feed tomorrow morning. All right, that's it for today. But until next time, my advice is to just focus on keeping your customers happy. Thank you.